The plea of churches of Christ is for the restoration of the church of the New Testament. However, many think it's impossible. Others think that even if it were possible, it's not desirable that the church of the first century would not work in the 20th century. Should we try to restore first century Christianity? Stay tuned for today's program on Our Plea. The Churches of Christ of the North Texas area present The Truth in Love. How precious is the blood divine by inspiration here. Rise of love, His grace and shine to guide my soul to heaven. Welcome to our program and a Happy New Year to you. We pray that 1986 will be the finest year you've ever had. I'm David Roper, your host and evangelist with the Brown Trail Church of Christ. It's a special pleasure to me to have my brother Coy Roper on the program today. Coy is the head of the Bible department at Michigan Christian College in Detroit, Michigan. He'll be speaking to us right after this next song. Hallelujah, praise you. This program is brought to you by Churches of Christ. You may be wondering just what is the Church of Christ? What do you people teach? That's a fair question. We ask for your interest, for your attendance, for your investigation. Why do we have a right to ask? Just how is the Church of Christ different anyway? A salesman friend once, uh, a salesman once asked a preacher friend of mine the question, uh, why, why is the Church of Christ different? If you can tell me six ways the Church of Christ is different, or six things that people can find where you preach that they can't find elsewhere, then I can sell the church for you. He had the right idea. If we are not different, we don't have any right to exist as a separate entity. But why are we different? The difference, I believe, is wrapped up in our plea. I believe if you'll investigate Churches of Christ, you'll discover that the Church of Christ is unique because of our plea. What is that plea? One, we plead for the restoration of New Testament Christianity. Two, and the unity of all believers in the one church for which Christ died. Three, through complete obedience to the Word of God, rightly divided. Four, and the absolute rejection of denominational churches, names, creeds, and concepts. To state our plea is one thing. To persuade you to accept it is quite another. It's true, of course, that uh, a lot of people are attracted simply by the statement of the plea. They're so fed up with denominationalism that anything that claims to be non-denominational is attractive to them. Yet, 
usually after we say this is what we're trying to do, questions still remain. Is the plea valid? Will it work today? What will it do for me? Let me this morning present uh, the evidence for you and you make up your own mind. We'll act as if I'm the attorney presenting the case for our plea. You be the jury. You be the judge. You decide whether or not the case is persuasive. First of all, I would argue that our plea is biblical. Even if you have only a passing knowledge of the Church of Christ, you know that we claim to speak where the Bible speaks and to be silent where the Bible is silent. Therefore, even when we state our plea, we need to begin by stressing that it is a biblical plea. It's biblical to start with because it's always biblical to go back to a pattern that God gave originally. The Bible says that when God was telling Moses how to build the, uh, the, the, the tabernacle, he said, see that you make everything according to the pattern which was showed you on the mountain, Hebrews 8, verse 5. When God's people had left that pattern, Jeremiah, many years later, said, stand by the roads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it, Jeremiah 6, 16. God is concerned about his pattern and he's always been anxious for men to return to it when they've left it. It's biblical in the second place to stress the need to preach and practice only what was taught and practiced in the apostolic age. For instance, Paul said in Galatians 1 verse 8, But even if we are an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to that which we preach to you, let him be accursed. We need to uphold the Bible. We need to go back to the Bible because the Bible contains the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25. The Bible is complete and makes us complete, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. The Bible came from God, so we dare not alter it, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. It's also biblical because we are always allowed and urged to ask men to return to the church of the New Testament. Paul said in uh, Acts 20, 28, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you guardians or bishops or overseers to feed the church of the Lord, which he obtained with his own blood. Jesus died for the church. He bought it with his own blood. Surely then we need to emphasize that church, his church, to love it, to preach it, to be a part of it. Surely it's biblical to uphold that church. You have a Bible. I'm sure you love that Bible. And you believe that you ought to, to go by that Bible, to follow it. Can you think of anything more biblical than to plead for a return to the church you read about in your Bible? But I would also argue that our plea is possible. Some might say it just can't be done. You just can't take something like the, the simple, uncluttered church of the New Testament and transfer it to our sophisticated age but it is possible, it can be done. Let me use just one line of reasoning. In Luke chapter 8 verse 11, in the parable of the sower, Jesus said the seed is the word of God. The seed of the kingdom is the word of God. Now Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You now have two facts before you. One, the seed of the kingdom is the Word of God. Two, the Word of God is living. You know what seeds produce, don't you? They produce after their kind. And they always produce the same thing. If you have a watermelon seed, and you plant it in America, or in Australia, in Africa, and Asia, it'll always grow watermelons. And it won't grow watermelons for you and something else for me and something else besides for somebody else. It'll grow watermelons for everyone who plants it. Furthermore, it'll grow watermelons whenever you plant it. 
If you plant it this year, it'll grow watermelons. Next year, it'll grow watermelons, and so on. As long as life remains in the seed, it'll continue to grow watermelons forever, if it remains alive forever. You see the application, don't you? In the Word of God, we have the seed of the kingdom. That means that it produces the kingdom. The New Testament church, and it produces nothing else when it alone is planted. It makes no difference who plants it, where it's planted, when it's planted, it'll still produce the same thing. Simply the New Testament church. It's reasonable to believe, isn't it? That the seed of the Word of God does indeed produce after its own kind. Think about it. If we do exactly what people did in New Testament times to become Christians, and then we do exactly what people in New Testament times did as Christians, what will we be other than what they were? We'll simply be what they were, simply New Testament Christians. And that's quite simply our aim, to do what men did in the first century to become Christians, and then to do what they did as Christians. And we believe that if we do that, we'll be just what they were, simply Christians only. After I'd explained this plea to uh, one lady, she replied by protesting, why, anyone could have done that. People all down through the ages could have done that. And I replied, exactly. Anywhere, anytime, anyone does just what was required of New Testament Christians, that's exactly what he is, a New Testament Christian. The seed of the kingdom always produces the kingdom and nothing else. And isn't it wonderful to know that that seed, the Word of God, always remains alive. As long as the germ of a seed remains alive, that seed will produce after its own kind. I've heard that wheat found in the pyramids of Egypt, thousands of years old, uh, remained alive so that when it was planted in this century, it still produced wheat. You know, the seed, which is the Word of God, abides forever. 1 Peter 1, 25, it'll never die. The seed still lives. That seed planted today will produce in the 20th century exactly what it produced in the first century, the New Testament church, Christians only. But in the third place, I would argue that our plea is desirable. That is, there are advantages connected with our plea that uh, all people are interested in. It's desirable, of course, because it's biblical. It has God's approval, and that should be enough for us. If we are, above all else, interested in pleasing God, it should be enough simply to say that this is what God wants. But here we'd like to point out that the, the plea is desirable for another reason as well. It's desirable because it will promote unity among those who believe in Christ. You know, God wants us to be united. Jesus prayed for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all may be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Paul exhorted the Corinthian brethren to be one. He said, I pray that you may all agree there be no divisions among you, but you be complete in the same mind and in the same judgment, 1 Corinthians 1.10. Furthermore, men are striving for unity. You know, there are Protestant observers present at international Catholic meetings and Catholic observers at Protestant uh, councils. Churches are merging. Denominational barriers are being broken down. Various denominations are cooperating together. While we were in Australia, three of the largest Protestant denominations got together to form the Uniting Church of Australia. On, on the congregational level, level uh, ministers exchange churches and there are cooperative meetings. The answer, though, to uh, the real question that is, is how can churches get together? How can there be unity? It seems obvious to me that uh, simply interdenominational cooperation or denominational dialogue falls short of making us one in the way that Jesus prayed for oneness and Paul pleaded for oneness. However, there is a way that we can all be one. We can't be one on the basis of what I believe or what you believe, our opinions. 
because I hold my opinions as sincerely as you hold your opinions, and I have as much right to my opinions as you have to your opinions. What's needed is a common meeting ground, a place equidistant from both of us, an authority that both of us can agree on, an unbiased authority. That meeting place is the Bible. When we go back to the Bible, we all leave our opinions at home. That book is as much yours as it is mine. The truth it contains that I teach is not my truth, but God's truth. And the same can be said for the truth that you teach, you believe. So when we all decide to go back to the Bible to discover what God wants us to do, I don't have to surrender to you, you don't have to surrender to me, we both simply surrender to God and His Word, and if we'll all do this, we'll be united in Christ, united by our common obedience to the Word of God. But let me add forth that our plea not only is desirable, it is also essential. That takes us one step further. We've noted the possibility and the desirability of restoring New Testament Christianity. Now we want to consider the necessity of restoring New Testament Christianity. I want to suggest very kindly that to follow the New Testament, to be just a New Testament Christian, is the only way to be sure of pleasing God. Consider that necessity from a positive viewpoint to start with. If we do what the New Testament says we must do to be saved, we will be simply New Testament Christians. If we believe, we can be saved. If we don't believe, we'll be lost. The Bible says, unless you believe that I am He, you'll die in your sins, John 8, 24. The Bible tells us that God requires us to repent Acts 17, 30. If we repent, we can be forgiven. If not, we'll perish. Luke 13, 3. People in New Testament times had to be baptized to be saved. Mark 16, 16. Acts 2, 38. Surely we also must be baptized to be saved. In New Testament times, the saved were added to the church. Acts 2, 47. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. And according to the Bible, Christ is the Savior of the body, the church, and there is but one body, one church, Ephesians 4.4, 4, Ephesians 5.23. Isn't it obvious that if we do what the Bible says we must do to be saved, we will be in the New Testament church. We will be Christians only. Is it possible to reproduce the New Testament church? I say it's essential to reproduce it, otherwise no one is going to be saved. But let us also think about the necessity of New Testament Christianity from a negative viewpoint. If we fail to do what the New Testament teaches so that we are something more, something less, or something different from New Testament Christians, we're in danger of condemnation. Consider carefully these passages. 2 John verse 9, anyone who goes ahead and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ, does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine has both the Father and the Son. Matthew 15, verses 9 and 13. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Every plant which the Heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The New Testament tells of wonderful blessings connected with being a Christian, remission of sins, peace of mind, the hope of heaven. Everyone knows that, and, and everyone wants those blessings. But the New Testament also speaks of a church, a way of life, and of commandments that must be obeyed. The trouble is that many today want those blessings without being in that church, without living that kind of life, without obeying those commandments. My friend, it can't be done. 
The blessings promised in the New Testament are inseparably connected with the church described in the New Testament. To have the blessings, you must be in the church. It's as if a man decides he wants to enjoy the blessings of being an Englishman, but he doesn't want to spend the money required to go to England. So he builds an English-style house on his land, he buys uh, English-style furniture and puts in it, he wears English-style clothes, maybe even affects an English accent, reads English newspapers and magazines. He may even put up a, a sign on the front lawn saying, Jolly Old England. But even after all this, he's still in America. He may look like an Englishman, he may talk like an Englishman, walk like an Englishman, but he'll never enjoy all the blessings of being an Englishman until he goes to England. Even so, today men may make a pretense of Christianity, but they'll never enjoy all the blessings of being a Christian until they actually become a part of the New Testament church. What church are you in? It may be much like the church Christ built, but if it's not that church, how can you hope to have the rewards connected in the New Testament with that church alone? With more than a thousand churches out there, a thousand churches claiming to follow Christ, there are obviously some counterfeit churches, some poor imitations of the real thing. A counterfeit is never worth as much as the real thing. Make sure you're not part of a counterfeit church. In the fifth place, I would argue that our plea is practical. You may be ready to say, well, it sounds good in theory, but it, it would never work in practice. You know, the best proof of the practicality of the plea to restore New Testament Christianity is that it has worked before. It has happened many times in many places. Let me be specific. Specific. Speaking at the 1967 Abilene Christian College lectures, a Spanish preacher and author named Juan Monroy said, and I quote, In August of 1964, I visited the New York World Fair. One of my books had been placed by the Spanish government in the Spanish pavilion, and I wanted to see it and sign a few autographs. While there, I entered the Protestant pavilion, and at the Church of Christ display, I became engaged in conversation with a preacher. Brother Tom Isaacs of the Gentile Congregation in New Orleans. After a prolonged conversation, I discovered that you people here have the same beliefs and practices as a group of Christians that we have in Spain. Following the Bible only and without uniting with any denomination, we had succeeded in starting various congregations in several Spanish cities. I was there on that occasion. I heard Juan Monroy say how suspicious he was when that preacher of the Church of Christ told him that we just followed the Bible only. Then I heard him say how thrilled he was to discover that we did in fact believe and practice the same things as those undenominational churches in Spain. I heard him tell how he had thought that those few Christians in Spain were the only people in the world striving simply to restore the New Testament church. I heard him speak of the joy of discovering that he had millions of brethren in the United States and all over the world working towards the same end. Imagine that. In the United States, brethren knew nothing of a restoration movement in Spain, and in Spain they knew nothing of a restoration movement in the United States, but then they discovered one another and they found that their aims and their doctrines were identical. Coincidence? Hardly. Not when the same thing has happened again and again all over the world. Restoration movements have sprung up completely independent of one another in many nations. In every case, when men go back to the Bible to restore apostolic Christianity, they come to the same conclusions concerning the worship, organization, and doctrine of the church. The restoration works. It's practical. It has happened again and again, and it can happen here. If men will go to the Word of God with open minds and seek to restore Christ's way as they find it there, the result in America will be exactly what it's always been, New Testament Christianity. Well, there's the evidence. You're the jury. What's your verdict? If you see value in our plea, perhaps you'd like to become one of us in this great worldwide movement to restore the church of the first century. 
Paul said, I count not myself yet to have laid hold. Philippians 3, 13. That's how we feel. It's not so much that we claim that we have restored as we say that we are restoring. We are attempting to restore the church Christ built. We do not claim that we've arrived. We only claim that we are on the way. We consider this a great adventure and we ask you to join us. You can help in the glorious quest for biblical Christianity. But how can you join this movement? The answer is obvious. If you want to help restore New Testament Christianity, first of all, you've got to become a New Testament Christian. How can you do that? We don't make those rules. We only teach the rules God has made. Here they are. First, you must believe. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am He, you'll die in your sins. Second, you must repent and be baptized, as Peter said in Acts 2.38. Third, as a Christian, you must be steadfast and faithful. Those are God's rules. Obey them and you'll be just a New Testament Christian. And you can join us and help spread the good news. You can be a Christian, a Christian only, without joining any denomination. God is the Now, thanks to Coy for that presentation. And I'm going to encourage you to do something today. I'm going to encourage you to spread today's message just as widely as you can. We have this message on uh, cassette tape. Let us know how many you'll distribute, and as long as the number's a reasonable number, we'll send them to you free. And this message is also available in track form. Again, let us know how many you'll distribute, and we'll send them to you free. There's no greater need in the religious world today than to get back to the teaching and practice and pattern of the New Testament. Now, one congregation is trying to do just that is the Church of Christ in Grandview, Texas. This fine congregation meets at 507 East uh, Kreiner Street in Grandview. The Sunday morning worship service is at 1050 a.m. If you live in that area, they'd love to have you visit. Now, until next week, may the love of God shine upon you. This has been The Truth in Love, sponsored by the Churches of Christ of the North Texas area. For a copy of today's program, additional information, or Bible correspondence course at no charge to you, please write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. Once again, write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. We invite you to attend the Church of Christ in your area. Join us again next Sunday at the same time for The Truth in Love.